understand this wavy behavior. Some wondered if a single electron while in motion might spread out into a wave. And the physicist Erwin Schrodinger came up with an equation that seemed to describe it. Schrodinger thought that this wave was a description of an extended electron, that somehow an electron got smeared out and uh, it was no longer a point but was like a mush. There was a lot of argument about exactly what this represented. Finally, a physicist named Max Born came up with a new and revolutionary idea for what the wave equation described. Born said the wave is not a smeared out electron or anything else previously encountered in science. Instead, he declared it's something that's really peculiar, a probability wave. That is, Born argued that the size of the wave at any location predicts the likelihood of the electron being found there. Where the wave is big, that's not where most of the electron is. That's where the electron is most likely to be. And that's just very strange, right? So the electron on its own seems to be a jumble of possibilities. You're not allowed to ask, where is the electron right now? You are allowed to ask, if I look for the electron in this little particular part of space, what is the likelihood I will find it there? I, I mean, that bugs anyone, <laughs> anytime. As weird as it sounds, this new way of describing how particles like electrons move is actually right. When I throw a single electron, I can never predict where it will land. But if I use Schrodinger's equation to find the electron's probability wave, I can predict with great certainty that if I throw enough electrons, then say 33.1% would end up here, 7.9% would end up there, and so on. These kinds of predictions have been confirmed again and again by experiments. And so the equations of quantum mechanics turn out to be amazingly accurate and precise. So long as you can accept that it's all about probability. If you think that probability means you're reduced to guessing, the casinos of Las Vegas are ready to prove you wrong. Try your hand at any one of these games of chance, and you can see the power of probability. Let's say I place a $20 bet on number 29 here at the roulette table. The house doesn't know whether I'll win on this spin, or the next, or the next. One. But it does know the probability that I'll win. In this game, it's one in 38. 21. So, even though I may win now and then, in the long run, the house always takes in more than it loses. The point is, the house doesn't have to know the outcome of any single card game, roll of the dice, or spin of the roulette wheel. Casinos can still be confident that over the course of thousands of spins, deals, and rolls, they will win. And they can predict with exquisite accuracy exactly how often. According to quantum mechanics, the world itself is a game of chance much like this. All the matter in the universe is made of atoms and subatomic particles that are ruled by probability, not certainty. At base, nature is described by an inherently probabilistic theory. And that is highly counterintuitive and something which many people would find difficulty accepting. One person who found it difficult was Einstein. Einstein could not believe that the fundamental nature of reality at the deepest level was determined by chance. And this is what Einstein could not accept. Einstein said, God does not throw dice. He didn't like the idea that we couldn't with certainty say this happens or that happens. But a lot of other physicists weren't so put off by probability. 
because the equations of quantum mechanics gave them the power to predict the behavior of groups of atoms and tiny particles with astounding precision. Before long, that power would lead to some very big inventions. Lasers, transistors, the integrated circuit, the entire field of electronics. If quantum mechanics suddenly went on strike, every single machine that we have in the U.S. almost would stop functioning. The equations of quantum mechanics would help engineers design microscopic switches that direct the flow of tiny electrons and control virtually every one of today's computers, digital cameras, and telephones. All the devices that we live on, diodes, transistors, just to form the basis of information technology, the basis of daily life in all sorts of ways, they work. And why do they work? They work because of quantum mechanics. I'm tempted to say that without quantum mechanics, we'd be back in the dark ages. I guess more accurately, without quantum mechanics, we'd be back in the 19th century. Steam engines, telegraph signals. Quantum mechanics is the most successful theory that we physicists have ever discovered. And yet we're still arguing about what it means, what it tells us about the nature of reality. In spite of all its triumphs, quantum mechanics remains deeply mysterious. It makes all this stuff run, but we still haven't answered basic questions raised by Albert Einstein all the way back in the 1920s and 30s. Questions involving probability and measurement, the act of observation. For Niels Bohr, measurement changes everything. He believed that before you measured or observed a particle, its characteristics were uncertain. For example, an electron in the double slit experiment. Before the detector at the back pinpoints its location, it could be almost anywhere with a whole range of possibilities until the moment you observe it. And only at that moment will the location's uncertainty disappear. According to Bohr's approach to quantum mechanics, when you measure a particle, the act of measurement forces the particle to relinquish all of the possible places it could have been and select one definite location where you find it. The act of measurement is what forces the particle to make that choice. Niels Bohr accepted that the nature of reality was inherently fuzzy, but not Einstein. He believed in certainty, not just when something is measured or looked at, but all the time. As Einstein said, I like to think the moon is there even when I'm not looking at it. That's what I was, was so upset about. Do we really think the reality of the universe rests on whether or not we happen to open our eyes? That's just bizarre. Einstein was convinced something was missing from quantum theory, something that would describe all the detailed features of particles, like their locations, even when you were not looking at them. But at the time, few physicists shared his concern. And I just thought it was giving up on the job of the physicist. Uh, it wasn't bad physics per se, it just was totally incomplete. That's Einstein's refrain. Quantum mechanics is not incorrect, it's as far as, insofar as it goes, but it's incomplete. It doesn't capture all of the things that can be said or predicted with certainty. Despite Einstein's arguments, Niels Bohr remained unmoved. When Einstein repeated that God does not play dice, Bohr responded, Stop telling God what to do. But in 1935, Einstein thought he'd finally found the Achilles heel of quantum mechanics. Something so strange, so counter to all logical views of the universe, he thought it held the key to proving the theory was incomplete. It's called entanglement. The most bizarre, the most absurd, the most crazy, the most ridiculous prediction that quantum mechanics makes is entanglement. Entanglement is a theoretical prediction that comes from the equations of quantum mechanics. 
Two particles can become entangled if they're close together and their properties become linked. Remarkably, quantum mechanics says that even if you separated those particles, sending them in opposite directions, they could remain entangled, inextricably connected. To understand how profoundly weird this is, consider a property of electrons called spin. Unlike a spinning top, an electron spin, as with other quantum qualities, is generally completely fuzzy and uncertain until the moment you measure it. And when you do, you'll find it's either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. It's kind of like this wheel. When it stops turning, it will randomly land on either red or blue. Now imagine a second wheel. If these two wheels behave like two entangled electrons, then every time one landed red, the other is guaranteed to land on blue. And vice versa. Now, since the wheels are not connected, that's suspicious enough. But the quantum mechanics embraced by Niels Bohr and his colleagues went even further, predicting that if one of the pair were far away, even on the moon, with no wires or transmitters connecting them, still, if you look at one and find red, the other is sure to be blue. In other words, if you measured a particle here, not only would you affect it, but your measurement would also affect its entangled partner, no matter how distant. For Einstein, that kind of weird long-range connection between spinning wheels or particles was so ludicrous, he called it spooky. Spooky action at a distance. When you have one particle here and one particle there, and they are separated enough that there is no signal able to allow them to communicate, and they still seem to be talking to each other, then is a big mystery. What's surprising is that when you make a measurement of one particle, you affect the state of the other particle. You change its state. There's no forces or pulleys or, you know, telephone wires. There's nothing connecting those things, right? How could my choice to act here have anything to do with what happens over there? So there's no way they take a 